So hello and welcome to the Screw the System channel. I am back with another one in another interview in the Pursue Your Passion series. Now I haven't done these interviews for a while but I absolutely had to do this one because I'm here with a very special guest today, Sam Jallo. He's very uh, kindly invited me into his home and I'm going to ask him about his incredible story. Now this story is based on a book called How Tennis Saved My Life. I came across this book because as some of you guys will know from my channel that I also work as a tennis coach, one of the parents of the kids I coach said, oh Joe, I've read this really excellent book, I think you'll be interested. I took it home with me, read it, and I was, my, my mind was blown. It's about so much more than tennis. Sam is from Sierra Leone and he had a dream of becoming a tennis player and he had to pursue that against the backdrop of uh, civil war in his country between 1991 and 2002. I think 150,000 people yes. were either tortured, mutilated or killed. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, so I'm here today to talk to Sam about that and uh, do stay tuned guys because we've got some very interesting questions and Sam's going to tell you about his very unique story. So Sam, first of all, I'm interested to know that um, not a lot of people play tennis in Sierra Leone. So it was somewhat of a, a unique dream for you. And I think in the book you mentioned that age, I think age, was it, or 1994, so you're age yeah. 12, yeah. you first had this idea that you could become, or you could become a tennis pro, or by playing tennis, you could escape or get out of your country, and it was, a, it was gonna lead to more money and a, a greater life for you. Could you just tell us about that moment when you first had this realization that becoming a tennis player was something you wanted to do? Yes, uh, well, uh, when I moved to my mom in Hill Station, and uh, just on the side of where my mom lived, 10 yards away from my house, there's three tennis courts. So, and uh, whilst I was there playing uh, hand tennis and boot bar tennis, and I overheard one of the kids saying, oh, uh, do you know that uh, Amidu has gone to play the ITF Junior and the under 14, and they'll be coming tomorrow, and also um, they're giving them $250 as allowance, and they got national track suits and rackets and all those things. So for me as a poor kid uh, with my condition and um, my family background, I was thinking, wow, you know, $250, that's a lot of money that could, um, you know, uh, help to sustain my family and also help to pay my school fee. So since then, I was really, really transfixed and I said to myself, I'll do whatever it takes for me to become a national tennis player to get that 250 US dollar so that I can feed my family and also I can able to pay my school fee. Plus also I wanted to get out of Sierra Leone and go compete internationally. But uh, most of all as well, I wanted to wear the national track suit. And indeed, when Amidu and the other guys turned up from the ITF Junior, and I was really, really amazed how well they were dressed with their green, white, and blue track suits and uh, nice tennis shoes, rackets, and everybody had so much respect for them. And that's when I decided tennis is going to be my life. That's what you wanted to do. Now, guys watching this, uh, most of my viewership, I assume, is, well, from the statistics I can tell is America or England. So when Sam is saying $250, you're thinking, well, that's not a lot of money. but in where he was living at that time, that was a significant chunk of money. And it helped, it would go towards supporting his family and um, helping him get himself out of Sierra Leone and traveling as well. So it's amazing because not many kids, I mean, I, I guess football is the main sport in Sierra Leone. So it's not, tennis is not immediate, you wouldn't associate that with Sierra Leone too much. Yes. So to have that dream and then be so focused, but the the most interesting thing about it for me is the backdrop against which he had to do all of this. Um, you wouldn't have seen it, well, you, you probably won't want to see it, but Sam was showing me his toes earlier because for until the age 13, he played barefoot. He didn't even have trainers. He was chasing this dream without any of the proper equipment. He mentioned bat tennis earlier, Board bat or, tennis. or even hand tennis. He was playing tennis with his hands. So it just, he, you had everything going against you. Worst thing of all, then a civil war erupted. So he still had to try and train and play amidst the backdrop of that. And actually, that's something I was quite interest from, interested from reading the book is how did you train and play when, when you had, uh, you know, there were army troops coming in, storming the, 
the area or um, you know people were dying all around you how did you actually manage to to maintain keep hold of that dream how did you not just give up give up on it completely well like you said again uh, when I started uh, we didn't have rockets because we couldn't afford one and even for the people who could afford it, there, is no, there was no shop in San San Sierra Leone that actually sells tennis equipment. So people who travel abroad, we usually buy rackets and bring it for other players who can afford it. But so what we did, uh, we play bare hand tennis, which is a popular sport in Sierra Leone. And I was a champion in that. <laughs> and then also, um, and uh, we, we create the board, but which is more like beach tennis or paddle tennis. So that's what we were using because uh, like I said, we didn't have rackets. And um, also to keep the focus going during the, the Civil War, this is why the book is actually named How Tennis Saved My Life. Because when the war uh, was going on in, in Sierra Leone, we have nothing to do and the fighting is going on. So the only thing we have was the tennis court. So we usually go to the tennis court playing hand tennis or board bat tennis. And if we have rackets occasionally, which we, we would borrow rackets from either one of the rich people, or if we have a racket from one of the coaches and then we can use it. So during those times, the tennis court was more like a safe place for us because when people are fighting, nobody look at the tennis court, empty tennis court and say, well, let's go there and fight on the tennis yeah. court. So the tennis court was much more safer than actually being in your house. So, so for us, we, we were on the tennis court doing as much as we can, but when the fight gets really, really intense, then we obviously stop playing tennis and then when it's cool then we get back into our tennis and things like this and another thing which um, also happened during this period when we actually had rackets one of the biggest thing we struggled with in Sierra Leone in those days was to get strings so basically <laughs> uh, we had uh, all the players who uh, started the habit of going to town and buying the shark fishing line you know like the <laughs> shark fishing line so they'll buy that and that's exactly what we used to restring our racket with and in the first five minutes it sounds good but after that it just lose so much tension yeah. but uh, we didn't complain did you, it, even, did you even have proper stringing machines uh, we did have maybe two stringing machine in the whole country but one of them was uh, owned by my cousin who now lives in london and it's one i've never seen the second one of that ever before you you have to wind it and wind oh, it and yeah, wind yeah. it and wind it and it takes time just to pull one string and then um also just to add up to to the struggles we had in in sierra leone and we didn't have grip so we cut old clothes or old or very old dirty towels to wash them mm. and that's what we use as a grip and um when i actually went to ghana I learned to restring rackets uh, with my bare hands. <laughs> so I was actually playing prize money circuits in Africa without restringing machine, That's but also uh, using my bare hands to, to restring the racket, which I could restring to 60 pounds, 70 pounds, whatever tension you want. <laughs> and we learned to do this. And like Joe said again, I had my first shoes when I was 13 years old. And this actually happened because I was in the national tournament and uh, one of the sponsors, a white guy who was there to observe the tournament and he asked the coach like why is he playing without shoes and temperatures were boiling hot and here I was running around and the coach said uh, well he doesn't have one. So the following day I was in the semi-final and this guy turned up with a brand new pair of shoes and boy oh boy that's probably one of the worst things that ever happened <laughs> to me because that was the match I was supposed to win so actually qualified uh, as part of the Sierra Leone national team because only the top two, the winners and the finalists will automatically qualify to play for Sierra Leone. So the semi-final was my beat, you know, to, to beat this guy. But and then put these shoes on. It felt like somebody put a bucket of super glue under my feet. I couldn't move. They were so uncomfortable. And I have to ask the umpire that I need to take the shoes off because they're really bothering me. So. <laughs> In the second set, I took them off and here I was again, you know, um, with my bare foot. I lose pretty much seven of my nails. But again, this was what it was and that's what gave me the drive because um, like uh, to finish your question is what gives me the drive to keep going. Yeah. When you grow up in a country with civil war and extreme poverty where you have one meal a day, you have no shoes, you have to walk, you know, 15 miles back and forth to go to school and three miles to go fetch water. You know, you, you have a desire and passion to do something 
for the future so that you don't end up with this kind of life. So you have something, everything for us was an opportunity. Playing tennis when I had that the kids are getting money and national track so that become a thing for me where I said I will do whatever it takes yeah. you know for me to be a part of this and and do you think Sam that there's a case that when you are in such a difficult situation like that because your opportunities are so limited it's yeah. like this has to work yeah you know tennis has to get me out of here because otherwise you know I could potentially die yeah I'm in a war zone so in a way what I'm saying, what I'm trying to message, I'm trying to get to you, across to you guys is you may, obviously, very few of you will be in the situation that Sam went through and you may have lots of different options, but it may actually be beneficial to you to sort of adopt the mindset that he had and limit them down just to one yeah. and say, OK, well, yes, you're not in a terrible situation. You're not facing war and poverty, but have that mindset that you've got to you've got to make that one thing happen. So do you think because of that, it was in a way, maybe easier to focus on it and say, yeah. I've got to make this work. Yes, because I was, uh, I was a complete athlete. I, was, I could have uh, run for Sierra Leone if I wanted to. I, could have, I was the best junior goalkeeper in Sierra Leone when I was uh, 15. And I remember, you know, uh, like I was saying to you yesterday, I went to the coach and told him, I don't want to do tennis anymore. I don't want to do football anymore. I just want to focus on tennis. And he looked at me and like, are you drunk? Have you been drinking or something? What's wrong with you? Who have you ever seen, you know, from Sierra Leone playing tennis, you know, to, to make money or make something. But so tennis wasn't as big. But the, the thing, like you said, is for me was that uh, I choose to play tennis and I give tennis everything. There was no plan B. Yeah. There was no to say, you know, I'm a black belt martial artist, so I was that good. Even Taekwondo, I could have gone to the Olympic and, and fight for Sierra Leone if I would have choose to continue, you know, with uh, martial arts. But I decided that tennis is a sport I want to do and I'm going to give it everything because I want it to be better. Keep your focus on something, go for it and, um, and give it everything that you have. And uh, giving up was not an option for me. So the, mm. in my vocabulary, there was nothing called giving up, you know, because... When you see the struggle you, you wait, you, you're going through every day with the hunger, the starvation, the war crime, the killing, and you know, um, kids went into drugs, child soldier. So for you to have the word to say, I'm giving up, that never ever exists. It's mm -hmm. something that we, you know, when I was growing up, the word giving up was never, never an option. So you have to do whatever, and that's what happened to myself, yeah. you know. Uh, choose tennis and give be honest to tennis and myself you yeah know? so yeah. yeah so this is the end of part one of the interview but we're going to be back in part two where we're going to talk a little bit more about the the war and politics of what sam through went through then get to the later stages of his journey how he actually did get onto the itf um, junior and the uh, future senior circuit and a bit more about what he's doing now because obviously we're here in southport in england he did um, leave Sierra, Le Sierra Leone and he's doing a lot of interesting stuff now as well so we're going to dive into that in part two so stay tuned So we're back with part two of my Pursue Your Passion interview with my guest Sam Jello here. So we talked a little bit about his upbringing in Sierra Leone, the moment he had the dream to become a pro tennis player and get out of a very difficult and war-torn situation. We're going to fast forward a few years now to I think when you were around 16 or maybe a bit older yeah. and you had a crucial match which was going to enable you to go and play ITF tournaments abroad on the, um, the West African circuit. Yeah. And uh, you had a whole lot of pressure on your shoulders at the moment. Not only was he playing to fulfill his dream, but he was going to get a significant amount of money which would help provide for his mum and also pay some important school fees. Yeah. So my question to you, Sam, is how do you, I mean, tennis is a pressurized sport, probably one of the most pressurized sports out there. Yeah. But you're not only just playing a match, you've got all of this on your shoulders as well. How do you cope with pressure 
in that situation and throughout your entire journey? Mm -hmm. So when I was playing back in, um, in 1998, I was 16. After all the disappointment I've had over the years trying to make it to the national team, and there I was again in the semi-final and playing against the same guy who I lost to before. But it was a decision that I made and said, you know what, I am going to do everything it takes. I will not be a loser. I will get to that national team and win this match because I'm doing this to remember why I was playing tennis. I wanted to help my sister and I want to help my, my mom. I want to pay my school fee and I want, also want to wear the national track suit. Plus then my best friend has been killed, which even feel the, the, the put more, you know, fire into me that, okay, this is no more about the money or the travel also, but this I'm going to do justice to my best friend who was killed. Yeah. And so this kind of thing, it helped me rather than push me backwards. So what you're saying is that almost became more important to you yeah. than the pressure. That yeah. was your focus, yeah. not the not, pressure. Not, not the not the that, focus yeah. was all the reasons why you yeah. had to do this. Yeah. The, 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 the focus was because, uh, like I said, when I was actually playing the match, I remember when I was describing in the book at the final set, when I finally had the break and to serve, uh, I was 6-5-0 uh, because Gabriel was probably one of the biggest server, but I had a little bit bigger serve than him. And he come from a you know, middle class to rich family, so he, he got everything that he want. And he was a really good player. I think the difference is because my situation is I was more stubborn. You know, and like I said, giving up was not part of it. So I remember after the changeover going to self and I'm thinking to myself, I start thinking, okay, my sister, you know, how my sister was struggling. I think oh, about my mom, I thought about yeah. my friend and I go, when I get up, I said, this is for them. So I'm going to yeah. do and, you know, uh, within four self and it was all gone. So, <laughs> so that for me, I use that as a motivation, even to today. When people always said to me, why do you spend so many hours working doing this, never stop. I'm doing it because I still have to support my mom, I still have to support my sisters, and I have to support my foundation. Because if I achieve certain things, that help the children that I'm helping in Sierra Leone, my family. So I always take, um, I always, uh, I'm always driven by my responsibility. Yeah, yeah, it's a great, a great answer. Because I think it's the message to you guys, as he says, is focus on what you're, why you're doing it, yeah. whether why you're playing or why you're building your business, whatever it is, rather than all the things you've got, all of the things, that, all of the pressures mounting on your shoulders. Yeah. Um, so the, the journey continues, you get to play for the national team, um, but then when you get older, you want to get to Ghana, to go and yeah. train in Ghana, because you've had a very generous offer from a coach who's seen yeah. you play, and he says, come and train in Ghana, um, you, you could go and stay at his place and you have this incredible, I think it's 1,800 meter, um, Mile. meter, mile Miles. journey, yeah. uh, facing a lot of difficult, diff difficult situations. And yeah. something that stands out when you read Sam's book is there's, there's two contrasts here. There are some of the most kindest and generous people in the world that you'll come across and then some of the biggest <coughs> psychopaths that you'll ever come across as well. So I want Sam you to talk a little bit about it because your it strikes me reading it that your journey wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for other people. Yeah. So many times people either paid your school fees yeah. or gave you equipment, tennis rackets, yeah. or just transported you places for free so yeah. you could get to a tournament or get to somebody's house. Yeah. And and what I I guess what I'm trying to get to is People were, seems that people in Sierra Leone and the surrounding areas genuinely have this, this spirit of kindness and wanting to help. My experience is very different, obviously. I've grown up here in the UK and yes, I've had one or two mentors who've helped, helped me, but my experience, I don't know how it is for other people growing up in, you know, so-called Western world or more developed countries, um, there's that many people don't give a shit basically they're only interested in themselves and they're not really going to spend any time helping you not all the time I had had a few people have helped me but that's a general feeling I have yeah. so I it was like heartwarming for me to read the book yeah and and see that people helped you um, do you have any because now obviously you live in the UK so you've got experience of both cultures yeah. do you have any any explanation as to yeah. why it seems people in that area growing up where you did 
seem so much more generous and willing to just give just from their heart basically yeah. and not not with an ulterior motive they want to get something out of you do you, do you have any idea why that is yes uh, the first thing is uh, Sierra Leone or the whole of Africa itself um, unless if people have get the sometimes the misconception about Africa but one of the thing you notice in Africa is the first thing is people are friendly and people are generous and we've been brought up as a culture to look out for each other if you go to Ghana, uh, you'll find out it's the same mentality about look out for each other. Even though, yes, we've had the, the war situation where we've had, like you said, I've lived with some of the most, you know, grueling, gruesome or, you know, most scariest people on the planet. Uh, one was Samboka, who was General Mosquito, who was the rebel commander, you know, Fode Sanko, including Charles Taylor. And all these other people who were rebels and who were just, you know, mutilating, amputating and, you know, just killing people left and right without even thinking. And so, but that was because of some political reasons and people who are ambitious to have power and resources in Sierra Leone who, you know, initiates younger children, you know, to go and cause all this atrocity. But uh, generally you'll find the culture around um, the whole of Africa is that people are genuinely will help each other out. And like you said, so many times I'm in a situation where I'm so lost and so confused and then somebody will come from nowhere. An example would be was when I was trying to get to Liberia because they, I've had an offer to go to Ghana to practice there because of the war situation in Sierra Leone. And I got to a place in, uh, in Guinea and where I was rejected to be a refugee in a camp and um, sat down looking at people going about their business and I was confused. I'm thinking, wow, well, I got, you know, over 600 miles you know just to get to Monrovia and now I run out of money so whilst I was whilst I sat down thinking and then this guy you know called Big Marshall as I know him in the in the end came and said hey uh, I'm, I've been paying attention to you why are you sitting down looking like um, you know something is wrong I said yes uh, well I'm good but I'm trying to get to Liberia but I got no money left so he took out some money and said well you know, this is what left. I'm a businessman, but when you get to this city, when you come into us, like we stop there and I can help you out. So, you know, and this guy didn't do it because he wants something for me. Yeah. I never saw him again after that, you know. So that's why at the end of my book, I put all the angels, the people yeah. who helped me, you know, on the way and who does things for me. Like the guy saw me in Ghana and said, how come you guys, you know, you're fighting war, but you still, um, you know, playing tennis. And he watched my matches and said, wow. You know, I just love your passion. I love the way you compete, the way you fight. So I can offer you to come and stay with my family if you can make your way back over here. And then I went to Sierra Leone. I didn't have enough money to get a flight ticket. So I decided to go by road. And then going by road, as I described in the book, was probably, it was um, in the end, I, I learned a lot of lesson, but I could have lost my life, you know, trying to get to Ghana by road, which uh, something that's supposed to take me an hour in a flight. Uh, took me way over two months just to get you know from Sierra Leone you know to Ghana and struggle on the way so yes the and the difference in England I think is because here people are more independent um, you know uh, people are more single it's like only me my wife and my kids or just me 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 mm, yeah why in Africa we still the husband the wife the kids the wife parents the wife parents parents and uh, husband parents so you can live in one house with 50 people from all the families just <laughs> managing so that's the way we were and that's the way we've been brought up so and why is i think the developing country or western world is the people uh, independent with their own house with their own job with their own money so you don't really need to worry about your parents so much or others because they're all uh, comfortable and good enough to live their own life so yeah. That's that's what the the difference is. Why is in Africa we still depended on each other, you know, to survive, you know, to to push each other to the next level, to survive the next day, to share among each other so that we all can survive every day. So it's it's very more community oriented and family oriented <clears throat> than, than the Western world. So that's the sort of uh, the the generous side of the people there. And actually, it's a good word he puts in the back of his book. Sam has all the the angels which help him, it's here yeah. at the back. And it's such a good word to use because yeah. it almost does seem like you're on your journey, yeah. all hope is lost, you're in an yeah. impossible situation, and then one of these people just comes just in turn up, yeah. and helps you. And it's, yeah. it's incredible to realize that 
you know that that can happen this this sort of hidden hand is where, when you're trying to pursue your dream yeah. there's a hidden hand or a hidden force which is also helping yeah. you yeah. along the way yeah. now so we talked about the the positive side of some of the people there now obviously you were in a civil war yeah. and you experienced and saw firsthand many brutal um, sites many brutal occasions where people were just doing horrific things to others one thing that stood out in my mind when I was reading the book was the story of when you uh, saw a group of people, what you thought were kicking a football around, yeah. but actually when you look closer, it was a human head yeah. that they were just kicking. Yeah. And so my question here is how, how do people get like that? How do they go to the point where they have no sympathy or empathy for other human beings and will just brutally kill them for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. For this day I came out and there's a lot of noise going on at the Lomley Junction and I had this group of young people, about 50 plus of them, they you know, putting their guns up and the others are kicking something so I bump into the crowd and just look and actually they've killed one of the foreign soldiers and uh, caught me to let their head and these guys were at the point where they were kicking the head like a football in rejoice that uh, they've killed an enemy. So me as a young kid, um, running back into the house, uh, almost throwing up and crying and I'm, I'm confused and I'm thinking, how do we get to this stage where as human beings we lose empathy? I mean completely lose empathy for each other to that point, but this is due to the greed, selfish nature of so-called people who are educated and ambitious to take power and use innocent children and young men and women to, to carry the dirty job that uh, they wanted you know to, to get into power and this is all because of the resources and everything and 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 I was so confused during the war that how can we produce this kind of human beings mm. you know in our society and and another incident which happened to me I, I remember you know, my mom sent me to town to get a gallon of palm oil. By then the, the city has calmed down a little bit. But everywhere there was rebel checkpoints and every like 200 meters, you know. And we got to this particular place, it was a checkpoint. And there was, you know, flies, everything. And on the post you see a human finger, a human hand is being tied over there just to put fear on people. Mm -hmm. And then on a stick, you know, there's a human head which is attached uh, on the stick. So that you don't ask questions, you obey. When you go there, you see that kind of image. You start yeah. thinking that could be me. So you you try and be obedient and 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 be peaceful with these people. So anyway, to come to the end of that story is, they put us into two groups. The the count this, okay, you guys over there, and you go through the barrier. So we we were going, and then a few seconds later, we just had like rapid gun AK for the seven, da 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 da, da. and then when you turn around. The same people you're working with just been shot. Not because they've committed any crime, not yeah. because they were, you know, fighters. They don't even have a clue why the war was there. But this is the kind of level that uh, humanity reach. You know, that for me, I said, like, the whole world sit down and see all this atrocity going on against, you know, young children, family members, old, young, and nobody did anything. And so I saw that, you know, firsthand. And this is a part of my, the reason why today, you know, I'm working so hard, you know, that's why I, I take up the job more as a mental coach than anything to mentor the younger children to say, if I can come from Sierra Leone, you know, without a tennis racket, with a, you know, shark fishing line, no grip and playing barefoot and hitting with my bare hand. And if I can play the level of tennis I play, can you imagine what the children here can do? So for me now, it's more about motivating the younger generation so that we don't get to this situation where we can be so barbaric with each other, you know, uh, killing each other. Yeah. It, was, it was, I think for me, that was some of the toughest time ever as a child growing up, seeing all this cruelty and living with those kind of people. So we sort of come to, well, we haven't really come to the end of the Sam story because there's so much to uh, yeah. tell and so much to read. But I thoroughly recommend, guys, that you do pick up this book. I'm going to leave links in the, in the description of the video. Uh, on Amazon so you can buy a copy um, and do so yeah finish the rest of the read the books so you can hear the rest of the story this interview in terms of me asking Sam about his past we've touched on all of those we touched on what we're going to discuss today but before we go I'm interested in what you're doing now 
So you've put all that behind you. You achieved your dream, essentially. But the dream, when one dream finishes, it doesn't mean that that's the end of the story. Yeah, you yeah. can then have new ones and yeah. new goals to aim for. So yeah. what are you doing? Uh, what are your main focuses in your life now? My focus now, like you said, dreams do come true. I, like I said uh, in my TED talk, it's a dream until you wake up. It becomes a goal when you write it down. It becomes uh, achievable in reality when you take the necessary action. So after I've um, completed playing for Sierra Leone, I become a coach. I'm traveling, you know, I think I've traveled to getting close to 100 countries now, you know, with players around the planet who would have ever thought that coming from the slump of Sierra Leone to being able to do this. So now I, for me, for the future is I want to be a, a world-class motivational speaker. And I also want to be continue to write because I'm doing other books as well. And I want to continue to inspire other people. And then when my two daughters are grown up, uh, when they get to 18, 20 years old, I'm going to go back to Sierra Leone to, to try and open a little tennis academy there so yeah. that I'll be able to help the younger generation yeah. so we can start you know, looking at producing competitive players, but not also, but to help uh, to, to speak to the communities and help younger children, give them something that they can look up to, not just tennis, but other sports as well. Yeah, 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 you yeah. Know, so we can develop a more sporty society where we can, uh, kids can read my story and say, well, if I can make it when this war was there in poverty and now we don't have war anymore, you know, they can have the chance of playing tennis, of looking up, you know, to say we can stay positive. So this is what I want to do. I want to continue more writing. I want to continue a motivational speaker. Of course, I'm always going to be a coach because I work on the tour. I travel with uh, competitive players. You know, I'm working with a player from the US, from Spain, um, from Colombia and also player from uh, Taiwan and a player from, you know, even African players. So I got different, different players I'm working with and even here in England, I'm working with uh, British players. So, so for me, motivational speaking, continue my coaching and my writing, but also to be able to influence, you know, the younger generation. Yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, it's made me think, when you do set up your uh, academy in Sierra Leone, I'll, yeah. I'll hopefully by that point, I'll be a, full-time writer earning all yeah. my money from royalties but I'll come out of retirement to do yeah. a little bit of tennis coaching at your academy and thank you very much for letting me into your home doing this interview yeah. I hope well you guys are bound to have got a lot of value from what he said and as I said if you want to learn more do buy the book um, it's a really um, inspiring read it inspired me as I was reading it and it's not just even if you don't care about tennis you'll still find something in it so thanks again Sam thanks for today Thank and, you very uh, much. See you guys in the next video.